today. I want us to focus on today in three different ways. This Sunday, first, marks the second Sunday of Epiphany with that theme of Christ revealed, Jesus revealed to the world. John's Gospel is very much a meditation on the person and the work of Jesus. The one John describes as God's word made flesh, God's light of love among us. And for John, the miracles are signs. They're not things to worry about or get tripped up over. Yeah, how does all those litres, 120 litres times six, get transformed into a vast amount of wine that would uh, satisfy the village for many weeks. Well, how many? Depends on your wine consumption, I know. But um, for most of us, many weeks to come. But not to get trapped or, or caught up with that, but to see it as a sign. Where is it pointing? It's like when you see a signpost. You don't spend all your time just staring at the signpost and wondering what it was made of. You allow that signpost to point you to where you're going. And this, Jesus sa John says, was a sign by which, the first sign by which Jesus' glory was revealed. And it's a glory that is the best, the best wine has been kept to this moment. All the wine that has come before in the story of Israel, the story of the Hebrew scriptures, has find, found fulfillment in this Jesus, whose hour has not yet come. So allow that story to reveal to you the glory of Jesus who transforms just as he transforms water into wine he transforms our lives the ordinary things of our lives into something extraordinary in the light of God's love and when we turn to the reading from Paul to that troublesome church in Corinth, we find that he begins his reflection on the work of the Holy Spirit by focusing on Jesus. I want you to know, he says, that no one who is speaking by the Spirit of God says, Jesus be cursed, and no one can say, Jesus is Lord, except by the Holy Spirit. The Corinthian Christians lived in this amazing, uh, diverse port, this great city of Corinth with all its pagan worship. And they'd been caught up in, in that worship in the past. And sometimes they were carried away by their spiritual further, further as Christians. There was a tendency among some of them to emphasize the heavenly at the expense of the earthly, that Christ in heaven was what was all important and Jesus, the man of Galilee, was somehow second best. But Paul said, no one will say Jesus is cursed by the Holy Spirit. And everyone who says Jesus is Lord an amazing statement, that first creed of the Christian church and a statement that got them into trouble with the ruling powers, with the emperor who regarded himself as the Lord, as God's representative. Jesus is Lord, the great affirmation of those early Christians. And those words were said by the power of the Holy Spirit because they were fierce and challenging, amazing words. 
we say they trip off our tongues so easily, but for those early Corinthian Christians, that was an amazing, radical statement that Jesus, the man who died on a cross, was their Lord. The child born in Bethlehem, the man of Galilee, the Saviour crucified, the risen Lord. Jesus is Lord. That was said by people of every background the, as they became followers of this Jesus. Rich and poor, Jew and Gentile, men and women, slave and free, all expressed their faith in those simple, radical words, Jesus is Lord. And they're still radical in China. To say Jesus is Lord and not the Communist Party of China. They're still radical in the Middle East. They're still radical in our own nation where power at times is so corrupted. Jesus is Lord. And for Paul, that was the work of the Holy Spirit in all these diverse lives bringing them into a unity in this simple statement. This Sunday is the second Sunday in Epiphany. This week marks the beginning of the week of prayer for Christian unity. It traces its roots back to 1908 when an American Catholic priest, Paul Watson, proposed a time of prayer for the unity of the church. And then 40 years later, with the formation of the World Council of Churches, that week or octave became part of many churches' calendars across the world. And now, over 100 years later, we're, as Christians, still praying for unity, that unity that Christ longs for his church. As I say, it's not a week, it's an octave, it's eight days running from the 18th of January, the Feast of St. Peter, to the 25th of January, the Feast of the Conversion of St. Paul. What a wonderful combination. If you think of Peter and Paul, sometimes they were chalk and cheese, Tom, um, Tom and Jerry almost. They, they had their moments of real clash. They were different personalities. They were strong personalities. It was not always easy for them to be in the same room. But within them expresses some of the diversity and the unity of the church. The Corinthian church was an exciting place to be. The spirit was powerfully at work among them. But there were problems too. For one thing, they became divided according to the leaders that they kind of attached themselves to. I'm for Peter. I'm for Paul. I'm for Apollos. And then the really superior ones, I'm for Christ. I'm above all that. And Paul said, did, did, I die, did Paul die for you? Are you baptised in Paul's name? No, it's Jesus Christ that unites you. Jesus Christ not used as a label to show your superiority to others, but Christ who brings all together in unity. Now the charismatic renewal within the Western Church and the whole church in our times, in the last century or more, has been exciting has brought amazing new life into a rather staid Western church. But it's also brought its dangers and divisions. Some have become overconfident in their prophetic powers and forgotten to check those visions and messages against the example of Jesus, the Jesus of Nazareth. The thrill of devotion, 
the excitement of worship sometimes has got in the way of actually worshipping the living God. A true and humble focus on God. And it can lead to some feeling that they are extra special, more spiritual than others, and looking down on those who are not quite so articulate or so uh, vibrant or outward going in their faith. Paul says there are different kinds of gifts, but the same Spirit distributes them. There are different kinds of service, but the same Lord. There are different kinds of working, but in all of them and in every one, it is the same God at work. Now to each one, the manifestation of the Spirit is given for the common good. Some of you may not feel the Spirit is particularly at work among you. You may feel that others have those great gifts of speaking in tongues or um, leading praise and worship or being able to speak of their faith to others. But the Spirit is at work in you, in each one of you. Allow that Spirit to make you the Christians that Jesus and God wants not someone else but yourself truly truly transformed by that spirit of love and faith and hope we are all different containers and perhaps sometimes we feel we contain more or less but to each one of us there is something of the Spirit at work for the common good, not just for our own possession, our own enjoyment, our own superiority, but for the common good. The second Sunday of Epiphany, the week in which the week of prayer for Christian, Christian unity begins. And finally, this year marks the 50th anniversary of the formation of the United Reformed Church. And it's good to be reminded that the vision behind that union was that that union would be part of a widening, uniting of the churches in the United Kingdom. I recently dug out a, an old book by Gerald Priestland, who was the BBC religious affairs correspondent back in the end of the 1970s. He once described the variety of the churches and denominations as like a great cathedral with many side chapels, each reflecting the variety of their different traditions. He himself had been brought up as a public school Anglican, confirmed as an English Presbyterian, uh, forerunner of the URC, and later became a member of the Society of Friends. He said that dealing with so many words during the week, he found the silence of the Quakers so valuable. And for him, the Quaker side chapel would be, above all, a place of silence dedicated to the work of making peace. I wonder what the URC side chapel would look like. I found it a helpful image, that image of the great cathedral. But we might want to think beyond a building, however beautiful, and think of a variety of places and settings. The URC might be a home with a Bible opened, or it might be uh, a food bank. Think about where you would see the side chapel of the URC. Over this anniversary year, and the actual anniversary is in October, so there's plenty of time, but I want us to look again at the nature of our church and denomination. That can sometimes feel 
a little dull. You know, who wants to be part of a denomination? It sounds, the word itself sounds dull. And of course, the United Reformed Church in the United Kingdom is a pretty clumsy word or, or phrase as well. But we are part of the church, and denomination expresses our connection with other Christians and how that denomination fits in with other denominations. To start in those, uh, those reflections on our nature as a church, I go back to that statement that we use at elders' inductions and ministers' ordinations and different special occasions. It's a rather wordy statement called the Statement of the Nature, Faith and Order of the United Reformed Church. It might be wordy, but it contains some really important statements, some crucial ideas about what church is about. And it ends with a vision of Christians united in their worship and witness, drawing others to know the love of God. It has these words. We affirm our intention to go on praying and working with all our fellow Christians for the visible unity of the church in the way Christ chooses, so that people and nations may be led to love and serve God and praise him more and more forever. To work and pray. This week, in this week of prayer, but this year, may we continue to work and pray for that unity in the in the Church of Christ today. And a prayer. Lord God, we thank you for calling us into the company of those who trust in Christ and seek to obey his will. May your spirit guide and strengthen us in mission and service to your world. For we are strangers no longer, but pilgrims together on the way to your kingdom. Amen.